Well, we're going to be in Acts chapter 5 today, and as we continue and jump full force back into our series, To the Ends of the Earth, this is, uh, if you're uh, visiting with us or one of your first times, we're going verse by verse uh, through the book of Acts, and uh, we've been there, we spent all fall in the book of Acts, and uh, we dropped off right at the end of, uh, right at the Christmas season in Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And I will say, just by the, just for the record, if uh, we we have these journaling Bibles, they're the Book of Acts, and on one side it has the passage of Scripture, on the other side of the page it's all blank pages, and we have plenty of those. We have them available for you uh, for at no charge at the group at our groups table. And, and here's the reason why: um, in our groups, as we mentioned earlier, uh, that fire up next week. Uh, we do what we call sermon-aligned uh, group series. And so in our small groups, and our impact groups, we're taking time to discuss what we've learned on Sunday. This is a biblical principle. If you actually see in the book of Nehemiah, you see Ezra uh, actually get up and, and share the word of God with people. And then he said, go and talk about it, right? And so that's what we do here at Impact. And uh, so we're going to invite you. So we want to provide those for you. If you don't have one and you want one, you can slip up and go grab one real quick. Uh, if you want to get one after service, that's perfectly fine. But we want you to engage the text. We want you to engage the Word of God and write and circle and underline and write down your questions or your notes and take them to your group leaders each week uh, as you get into impact groups. Uh, it always makes, it's, it's really my favorite time. I call it stump, it's like stump the band time, you know, when you get to, Ask your group leader a question, hopefully, that they don't understand. Uh, that's my favorite part of being in groups, right? So we're in Acts chapter 5. We're going to pick up today in verse number 12. Uh, before we do, I want you to kind of think back and remember to the first time that you went to, like, a middle school dance. Some of you, like maybe some of our teenagers, that was like last semester, you know, like homecoming comes around and everybody's going. For a few others of us, it's been a few, couple years, right? But think back to the first middle school dance you go to, right? The gym maybe has some streamers, uh, somebody's uncle's probably the DJ, uh, maybe not, maybe, you know, you've got a DJ that's bumping some music and you got some lights and maybe if he's really good a fog machine but what you notice at least at my middle school dances is as you enter the room you notice all the guys on one side and all the girls on the other right not really commingling all of that much because it's like this sense of excitement and panic all at the same time. Of like, we kind of want to dance with him or her, but actually that means we've got to be close to him or her, so we're not quite sure, right? And then as, as things go along, you know, people began to dance and more people began to get into it. And here's what, I, here's what I've observed with, with dances is, is that when you go to a dance, people want to dance, Right? And so if you will ask somebody to dance, the, the likelihood of being denied that opportunity is really small. So the, so the threshold is really low, right? You ask somebody and it's like, okay, this is what we're here for. This is what we got to do. But, but here's the thing is if you ask somebody to dance, then you actually have to, what, dance, Right? So the bar is really high. The threshold is low, but the bar, the expectation is, is high. But slowly people began to dance and, you know, they get, get things into it. And then it's all good, right? And you have a good time, hopefully. And uh, there's the dance. Now, as a crude illustration, right, to where I'm going with this, as we pick up in Acts chapter 5, here's what's happening We've talked about it a little bit uh, over the past couple weeks as we've kind of summarized things, but the Holy Spirit comes in chapter 2 and the church begins to explode. Witnesses begin to witness. Disciples begin to make disciples. And we have this huge growing mass of people. In fact, in verse 11, 
is the first time it's referred to as church. It says, and, the, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things. Right? Speaking of Ananias and Sapphira who had lied and had defrauded themselves and were punished for that. The word for church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia, which is a combination word uh, meaning from the word ek, which means out of or from, and then the word kaleo, which is the word to call. So, so ekklesia in the most wooden of definitions would be those who are called out. It's often translated as the assembly or beginning now in Acts chapter 5 as the church. Those who have been called out. All of these people who have put their faith and hope and trust in Jesus, different backgrounds, statuses, ethnicities, colors, languages, male and female, young and old, coming together, the church. As we pick up in chapter number 5, verse number 12, here's what's happening. The dance is going well, right? What I remember about my middle school dances is there was usually a song that the DJ would timely play, that everybody knew, that everybody wanted to dance to, that everybody got off of the sides and jumped out onto the floor. And for us, this will date me a little bit, it was the electric slide, right? <laughs> everybody knew the electric slide. So, so imagine the DJ just plays the electric slide. Everybody's on the dance floor. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 5 verse 12. Everybody's up. Jesus is moving. The Jesus movement picking up steam. People are coming and trusting in Jesus. Only a few setbacks. Everything is rolling. If you have your journaling Bible, I'll give you the big idea. Write it down. Here's the big idea for today that I want us to embed in our, in our brains. God moves when we are obedient. God moves when we are obedient. Let's read the text and see what God has to say to us today. Verse number 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. Now let me back up here and pause and circle some things. Again, I've given you a journaling Bible. So this word now at the, end, at the very beginning of verse number 12, you can circle that. That's a key word. That's the Greek phrase, dia day, which means throughout time. Now, why is, why is that important? Because previously we've looked in Acts and there's been some sections here that have been day by day. If you go back to chapter 3, Peter and John walking to the temple that morning, passed by the beautiful gate. There's a lame man and, and he gets healed. And he goes in to Solomon's portico, which we'll talk about. Peter and John begin to testify. He begins to testify what happens. They get arrested the next day. They give trial the next day. So, so things happen day by day by day. But when this phrase comes up now, some of your translations may say over time or throughout those days or in those days. This was a, a period of time. This was a season, if you will, likely several weeks, perhaps several months over a little bit of time. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done throughout this period of time. So we'll see here in a minute what that looks like. But we're talking miraculous signs, wonders, things that people couldn't ex understand or explain other than just to say God was moving. God was moving in a unique way at a unique time in a unique place. It tells us Solomon's portico. Now, you're, you may say, your translation may say Solomon's colonnade or Solomon's porch, but this should ring some bells in your head. We referenced this back in chapter number three when we walked through. We don't know exactly where this is, but what we, most scholars would believe that Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch is an area on the east side of the temple that Solomon had built. This was a very public place, a big place. It was wide open. And it, has, it plays a big role in the early life of the church. In fact, if you go back into the book of John, you can see in John 10 where Jesus taught in Solomon's portico. And Jesus taught in Solomon's portico, and they didn't like what Jesus was teaching, and they began to stone him, and only his 
disciples pulled him away and rescued him at that point. As I mentioned earlier, John and Peter in Solomon's portico, Acts chapter number 3. They walk by the beautiful gate. They heal the lame man. He, for the very first time, restored physically and restored spiritually, restored socially, enters the beautiful gate. And in Solomon's portico, they begin to teach and preach. Peter stands up, says, this is what's going on, right? And same thing happens to Peter that happens to Jesus. The, the, the religious leaders, they don't like that. And so what do they do? They come in and they arrest John and Peter. So this was a, a prominent place, a public place, a historical place, a place where thousands of people could gather. So if you did business, if you were a religious person going in and out the temple, you hung out Solomon's portico. Like you knew the place, that's where everybody gathered. Nothing in Solomon's portico was private. That's what I want us to gather and capture and understand. Nothing was private. Everything was out in the open, unashamed. This is what was happening. And it kind of serves as a sort of ground zero for Christianity in the first century. This is where it begins. The apostles, despite the warnings, despite the arrest, despite Jesus' history there, despite the persecution, the resistance, the apostles obediently sharing the message of Jesus in the community, out in the public, doing what witnesses do, witnessing, obedience. Verse 13, none of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. So I don't know about you, that raises a question mark for me. What is this talking about when it says, you know, the signs and wonders were being done against all the, uh, to to the people amongst the apostles and they were together, but none of them joined them. What is, is is he talking about other believers, other Christians? It takes a little bit of work uh, to figure what out, what we're talking about, but it's very much referring to the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, members of the Sanhedrin, who would have been there and always were there doing their business outside of the temple, either coming or going into the temple or just hanging out. Right? There's actually a ton of references throughout the scripture of what would go on outside of the temples. There's money changing and miracles and healings and prayers and beggars and all the things. And Solomon's portico would have been the place that all that took place. So this is where the holy leaders, if you will, the leaders of, what, uh, of the, Jew, the Jewish leaders, this is where they were to be found and where they conversed. So when Jesus, in John chapter 10, spoke in Solomon's portico, and they were outraged, is the word that's used, they were outraged because they were already there, and they heard what Jesus was saying, and it challenged them. When, when John and Peter, in Acts chapter 3, were beginning to share the message of Jesus, and they, were, and they were annoyed by John and Peter. The reason they were annoyed is because they were already there. This was their space. This is what they occupied. So, so the religious leaders were the ones on the outside. They wanted to see the show, if you will, right? But didn't have the courage to participate. And here's what was happening. Is they had literally missed Jesus when he was there. They were missing Jesus again when he was there by the Spirit through his witnesses. The people, though, tells us, the people held them in high esteem. The people loved them. They were highly regarded, highly respected. Bring the apostles on. This is what God is doing, and it's amazing. Verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and Women. Let me give you some structural things for those of you like me that like to nerd out and some of the historical things. There's some structural things in the book of Acts and there's what we call or refer to as summary statements. And there's about seven of them that happen throughout the book. Uh, And this is one of those major summary statements. The first one we saw in the book of Acts was way back in chapter number two, verse number 47. After the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches... It tells us that 3,000 people came to know the Lord. They devoted themselves to prayer, to the apostles' teaching, to taking the Lord's Supper together, and to fellowship. And then it says in 247, the first summary statement of Acts, 
You can go back to page number 18 if you have your journaling Bible with you. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. God moves when we're obedient. Right? We see this in, in verse 14 here, and more and more. Right? More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. And what I want you to do is to take your pen and to underline or circle that phrase more than ever. Say, why don't we do this? Say that with me, more than ever. Ready? More than ever. More, more than ever. Catch this in context of the story of the book of Acts because there's been some amazing showings of God already in this book. On the day of Pentecost, as I just mentioned, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus. And were baptized and joined to the church. And that summary statement in 247 said that people were added daily to the church. Peter, when he preaches and gives testimony at Solomon's portico about healing the lame man, it tells us that 5,000 men came to faith in Christ. And now it says, more than ever. So do we, do we know how many people came to faith in Christ during this time? We don't. But I know that it's more than 5,000. It's more than ever has ever happened. Believers were added to the Lord. It says a multitude, and it helps clarify men and women. So this crazy, like diverse group of people from different ages, different nationalities that spoke different languages, that were different socioeconomic statuses, people that had tons of money that were selling things and giving things to the people who had nothing, men and women coming to experience Jesus every single day, something that had never been seen before of that magnitude. God moves when we're obedient. Verse 15, so that, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. It's an amazing story. It tells us in verse 16 that they were all healed. People were bringing other people and People were being healed of sicknesses, of sins, spiritually healed, physically healed. So much so, God was moving in such a way that their faith was so strong in Jesus, in the presence of Jesus by his spirit through Peter, that they would hope that even just by Peter's shadow falling on them, that they might be healed, and they were all healed, verse 16. Now, now, it's easy to, to get lost in the trying to figure out what this looked like and what God was doing. And I don't want us to get distracted necessarily, although it's a miraculous thing and we give credit for that. But I don't want us to di get distracted by what's happening. And here's what's happening is that God was moving like he had never moved before. God was, God was doing something unique in that place, in that time. He was using the apostles, the church, those called out to do something that had never been done and would never be repeated. Right? They, were, they were bringing other people. If you look at that verse, it's easy to skip over that word they. So that they even carried. Right? This wasn't happening one by one. This was people bringing other people. They were witnesses witnessing to what was going on and bringing people to experience and encounter God in a new and fresh way. In community, together, so that no one was left behind. Dependently on one another. In unity with one another. They did this. And it says in verse 16, And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and all those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Amen. All of them. Those people around Jerusalem, 
Catch this. This is kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come in the book of Acts. As the witnesses witness, as the movement of Jesus begins to spread outside of Solomon's portico, outside even of the walls right there in Jerusalem to those around Jerusalem. But don't forget what it, told, what it told us in verse number 15, that they were carried, right? This wasn't just a, a come and see. This wasn't an email blast that said, we're having a crusade, come and participate. This was more than an invitation. It was a let's go and get them so that they might experience God, right? So they might experience the power in Jesus' name. Let's go to them. It was like the original outreach movement, the message of Jesus, the hope in Jesus' name, our witness to Jesus spreading and spreading rapidly. It could not be contained to Solomon's portico. It didn't, didn't matter who could, who could see or who was watching or what might happen. This was real and they were all in and it was life changing and they wanted everybody to participate and everybody to, to get to experience Jesus in this way and they were all healed and we see the 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 pattern for this the precedent if you will back in chapter three and this is one of the reasons i believe the story of peter and john healing the lame man outside of the beautiful gate and what we see him physically being healed getting up and walking spiritually and in community restored with god heading to the temple for the very first time in his life not as an unclean, but as a clean individual, right? So physically, when we see, and they were all healed, spiritually restored, forgiven, saved. Now, this all, to me, as I, as I read these few verses, <laughs> sounds like an amazing scene. Like, this is something going on that, that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around, but think about the, the loads of people that were coming in that were physically healed, that were literally demon-possessed, and the chaos that would ensue, and just Peter walking through people getting healed because God was moving in such a palatable way, everybody wanted to experience it. I'm thinking like, can we get the makers of The Chosen to make this movie? Because that would be awesome. Right? I wonder what that looks like and what was going on. Right? Who could write this kind of script because the level of faith was so high that nothing else mattered. Only the message of Jesus and the power of his name mattered. Everybody was in. Except for those few guys. Those religious leaders, right? who wanted their own power and their own control and their own authority and were unwilling to see what God was doing. So a couple things that I just want us to catch as we kind of begin to land the plane, so to speak. A couple components here. Number one, God was the one moving, but none of the people were motionless. Catch this here. God was the one that was moving, but nobody was motionless. It tells us that they went out and carried people in. They went to the extra towns and they began to think, oh, my brother, he lives across town. He could use this. Like He needs to experience Jesus in this way. I need to go get him and bring him here. Right? And then all, along the way, we, we bump into a, a lame man or a beggar or a prostitute or a sinner, a tax collector. They need to experience Jesus. They need to experience what's going on. And we begin to witness and invite and bring. Right? None of the people were motionless. The apostles, day after day, showing up in public despite the persecution, despite the threats. Right? And the people, the church, those called out, bringing other people to hear, see, experience God. And when they ran out of people right there, they went and found more. They went a little bit further out, and they brought them to hear and see and experience God too. And here's what happens. Often we want God to move. Often we beg God to move. Right, to change our circumstances, to make things better. 
not even selfishly, sometimes selflessly. We want things to change for somebody else. We want God to intervene in their lives, and we ask him to do so. Right? But all the time, we want to remain motionless. We want God to do all of the moving while we are sitting on the sidelines. And instead, God's wanting us to get into motion. Because God moves when we are obedient. So God was the one moving, but none of us were motionless. Number two, the invitation to follow Jesus is, in, is inclusive, but the message is exclusive. I've said this before, and I want to double, double down on this. It's the threshold is low, but the bar is high. Right? The invitation is for everyone. It is wide open. Anyone. We see it reflected here. We see it in the life of the New Testament church, this budding, growing, diverse community that were just following Jesus. They weren't worried about how much money they had. They weren't worried about what sins they had committed. They just wanted to experience God. No matter their age, their gender, their race, their status, where they were from or what they had done, like the message of Jesus is inclusive. It is open, and it is open today in the same way that it was open then. Jesus is inviting you to trust in him today in the same way that he was inviting them to trust in him during that time. God's grace is enough. God's love is enough. God's power is enough. He can, he did, and he will. The message of Jesus is inclusive, but it is also the gospel of Jesus is exclusive. Let me explain using Jesus' words, not mine. John 14, verse number 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did that say no one comes to the Father except through Jesus and your good works? No one comes to the Father except for when they get themselves cleaned up and straight and life figured out. No one comes to the Father except for when they reach this status or get this accolade or have this level of success. Nope. It's exclusive to Jesus. Jesus also says, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If anyone would come after me, he says, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The message of the gospel is exclusive to Jesus. And here's the requirement, is surrender to him. It's saying, I am not enough. Jesus, you are enough. I don't have grace that you have, but I'm trusting in your grace. My love is not enough, but your love is endless. My power is not enough. Jesus, I trust in you. Right? It's this idea of surrendering ourselves to Jesus. Here's what I love about this passage and what we see throughout the rest of the book is the church never compromised this message in order to grow their congregation. Never happened. They didn't soften their stance. We'll see persecution begin to ramp up, scattering the people around. Never changed the message of the gospel. Threshold is low, but the bar is high. The invitation is inclusive, but the expectation is exclusive. Some still denied. Thousands, thousands were coming to faith in Christ. They were seeing what the psalmist says in Psalm 8410, that it is better in one, one day is better in your courts than thousands elsewhere. They were confessing sin. They were confessing their shortcomings, their faults, laying them down, trusting in the finished work of Jesus for salvation, not only in their own lives, but bringing others to experience the same. 
Still some denied. They couldn't see, they wouldn't see that Jesus is God. They weren't willing to deny themselves, to deny their own authority or power or control. They weren't willing to surrender. It just wasn't an option. And what happens is they missed out on life and community while they're here, fulfilled purpose while they're on the earth, and they missed out on eternity with Jesus. God moves when we're obedient. If you've been here over the last few weeks, you may be starting to feel a little bit of pressure to share your faith with people, and I'm glad (laughs) because you need to share your faith in Jesus with people. That is the expectation of a Christian, of a follower of Christ. That's what we do, witnesses, witness. We should talk about Jesus boldly and in public for whoever to see or hear without compromising. Right? Not stuck on the wall, cynicism, judgment, and blame. Rather, life in Christ. And here's what I've experienced about sharing my faith and I'm, I'm not, this is something that I am wrestling with myself, praying daily. Give me opportunities and boldness to share my faith. When you do, God moves in your life. When, when God moves, when we are obedient is our big idea. And let me tell you, when you're obediently sharing your faith, your life will change forever. If you listen to Bob say amen, right? Bob is probably the most gifted evangelist in the room, shares his faith all the time, and he would tell you by his own testimony, should have gotten him a mic and had him share, right? His life changed forever. The growth that he's seen in his own life from God moving in his life changed forever when he began to actively share his faith. God moves when we're obedient. So church, let's share our faith. Let's go out and bring people to what God is doing so that they might experience him in a new way, in a unique way, in a life-changing way. You may be here today on the receiving end, not, not really even sure what to think. You've heard your friends. Maybe one of your friends brought you today. Maybe it was a spouse and you're like, I'm not sure, but I'll go because she said I had to go, right? Praise God for your wife, or right, if that's the case, right? Or your friend who invites you and you're just not sure, right? You're interested, but you don't know what to do. You don't know how. Let me, let me make sure I don't miss this opportunity, right? The invitation to follow Jesus is open for you today. In the same way that it was open in those days, it is open for you today. And we invite you, I invite you to trust in Jesus today. What does that mean? What does that look like? It's a conversation between you and God. I believe it's, it's a prayer that you just tell God, I surrender. God, I don't trust in myself anymore. I trust in you. Here is my life. I think God honors that in any way that we communicate it. When we say, I believe that you are and I am not. The invitation is for you. And let me tell you, if you've yet to trust in Jesus, whatever you're searching for, Whatever in your life that you're pursuing, whether it be success or money or fame or fortune or happiness, relationships, fulfillment, purpose, none of those things will ever fully satisfy because that's not how you were made. You were made to be satisfied by a being that is God, the creator of the universe. And anything else that we fill that void with will never fully fill it. It will never fully satisfy until you trust in Jesus. So I invite you to do that today. 